My next guest is Stu Stone, who has worked in the world of hip-hop, acting, comedy, directing, producing, rustling, magic consulting, and podcasting. From rocking with Bob Saget to entertaining troops in Operation Iraqi Freedom, this is a man who has experienced many, many adventures, not least of which is co-founding the Canadian production company 5-7 Films. This is the 5-7 Chronicles with Parsa Eftakari. So I'm going to take you way back, way back to down memory lane. Okay. When you joined your journey as a voice actor. Okay. And it started when you were seven. Sure. And you have played so many roles. You were the friend of Clifford the Big Red Dog. <laughs> you were a Care Bear. You also played in the Magic School Bus. Correct. Which is one of the most iconic roles of your career. And I'm just wondering, what was it like, you, you know, doing these kind of roles? Like at, the voiceover the, stuff? Yeah, the voiceover stuff, because you, it was at, like at the golden age of Saturday morning cartoons, yeah. really the last golden age of those yeah. kind of cartoons. Yeah. You're right about that. Uh, and I grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons, so to be able to be a part of Saturday morning cartoons was so exciting to me. Uh, but, you know, being like a child actor, uh, Christmas was kind of ruined for me at a young age as far as like other kids would be scared to watch scary movies, but I would not be scared because I know that it was just a movie and I know how... You know, I, I understood at a very young age, you know, what goes on to make these things. But cartoons, I didn't really understand. Mm -hmm. I always wondered, like, how they did that. Because I used to, you know, watch cartoons and I didn't understand how it was done. So, you know, at age seven, to get into, you know, voice acting and stuff like that, it came pretty quickly. But, uh, yeah, you... It's, it's done in different ways, but for the majority of the stuff that I did back then, like, they would record the voices first and then they would animate around the performances. Now, it's different maybe nowadays with computer graphics and you know all this other stuff that they do, um, but that's how it was done back then. And when uh, Magic School Bus, which is a popular book series, I don't know if you ever had book fairs as a kid, but... I remember Scholastic, yeah. Book fair. He used to go with, you know, bring some money, try mm -hmm. to buy some books. It was like, mm -hmm. you could buy pencil cases, posters, whatever's there. Um, but Magic School Bus books were part of that, and I guess, uh, they decided to make a series. Cruising on down Main Street, you're relaxed and feeling good. Next thing that you know, you see. Octopus in the neighborhood, surfing on the sound wave, swinging through the stars. And I remember um, getting a call. I don't. I didn't audition for Magic School Bus. They, uh, that was like. Uh, they kind of just cast us all to come and do like a pilot episode, I think it was. So they just cast whoever wanted to do Well, the kids, there was, back then there wasn't a lot of peep kids doing voices, so there was, you know. It wasn't like LA. It wasn't like no. it is now, it where 5,000 yeah. people auditioned for every role. Back then, if you needed like a, you know, a boy voice, so to speak, a little kid voice, there's like three guys that <laughs> were doing it. And all three of us were on the Magic School Bus. <laughs> um, and they, you know, so they put us together. We, I remember shooting it. The, the first episode and not knowing what it was going to become but uh, obviously that turned into quite a quite a project uh, the magic school bus definitely is a it's went on to become an iconic thing like even today generations later people still know the show I've watched yeah you've watched it uh, at first you know maybe it was a great way for teachers to have a smoke break wheel the TV in and put on magic school bus for a half hour and uh, and hit the, go outside yeah. but uh, kids liked it yeah. uh, it was something that sort of snuck education into a cartoon not that subtly but for kids it was and they ended up loving it and obviously Miss Frizzle Lily Tomlin was a great oh, wow. you know comedic yeah. force and to have her be the teacher was a huge thing and we ended up doing uh, I think you know five six seasons I don't I don't remember how many but we did a lot of episodes and we did video games and we did you know it turned into a whole thing um, but yeah. what was the transition like when well, you, you started out doing it as a kid and then obviously you became a teenager and all that? Yeah. Like with you and your friends doing that show, how did that transition affect? You know, as the seasons get late, later, you hear like my voice get a little bit <laughs> scruffier oh, yeah. <laughs> because yeah, like obviously nature takes its course and your voice yeah. changes. Mine didn't, mine took a little bit longer. I was a bit of a late bloomer, so I was able to still do like kid voices like well into my late teens, and you know I th I feel like I could still do the voices, um, but yeah I mean some kids there was a couple kids that had to get recast because their voice changed so drastically, <laughs> yeah. um, 
There was a few Arnolds. There was a few Tims. Um, <laughs> there okay. was. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. Generally speaking, you know, I, I played Ralphie on the show, who uh, got to do the whole run. He was so a troublemaker. Was, he was a troublemaker, and I and in real life, I probably was the troublemaker behind the scenes. Um, yeah. How often were you going to school at this time? Since you were you were like acting a lot. I would. I missed a lot of school uh, as a kid. Um, but yeah, I I probably missed like ninety to hundred days of school every year. Uh, and that was on like a slow year. Okay, yeah. But uh, somehow I got educated, and uh, <laughs> and here we are. Yeah. Well, well I, I guess I helped educate kids. You helped educate me as well. You know, funny enough, uh, McLean's Magazine, on Canada's 100th anniversary or something like that, they did a, an issue where they had like the most influential Canadians, 100 Canadians in, or whatever it was, and I got picked to be on that list because I was Ralphie on Magic School Bus. And, you know, Ralphie was part of so many different kids' upbringing uh, and education. So that was really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what a show. I can attest to that. I remember you as Ralphie. I, yeah. Because we knew each other before we met. But you, you also, you went on to Hollywood after that. Yeah. And you started starring in a bunch of TV shows and movies. And one of your most iconic movies is Donnie Darko. And I'm wondering, what was it like working on that movie? Do you have any yeah, I have, memories? Sure. Uh, that is a funny story of how that came to be. Do you remember the movie Swingers? Did you ever see Swingers? I did see it with Vince Vaughn. Yeah. yeah, so there's like this scene in Swingers where Vince Vaughn tells the story where he's like auditioning and he's crying and everybody's crying their eyes out. The guy working the camera, you know, just filming it there. Got tears in his no. eyes. Is that the camera guy? And then, like, they realize that the part's really for, like, a six-year-old. But the truth of the matter was, you saw my picture, you saw my tape, you know I'm 24 yeah. years old, why do you call me in? <laughs> That's kind of was my story for Donnie Darko. Like, when I first went to go to that audition, it was advertised by my agent at the time as, like, oh, they're casting for this new Drew Barrymore movie. Mm -hmm. Like, that was the draw and the allure, that it was, like, a Drew Barrymore movie. It wasn't, like... You know, come be in Donnie Darko. It was like, there's the Drew Barrymore movie they're looking for kids. And I went in and I remember going to the audition and there was like all these like 11 year old kids and me. And I was not 11. And I would call, I, I remember walking out and calling my agent and being like, are you sure that this is the right place? Like, I'm, like these kids, I'm like, I'm not 11. And they're like, well, if they saw your picture. Just go in. What, like, what could go wrong? And I'm like, okay. So I went in and I read. And I had a pretty good read, I guess, but then like I never heard anything. So I guess the original concept of Donnie Darko was that he was gonna be younger. He was probably gonna be okay. like, you know, 12 year old kid or something like that. And right up until they were about to start shooting, that's when Jake Gyllenhaal signed on to do the movie and the age went up. So they had, the shoot was starting like the next week. So yeah. the, the one kid that, that was, <laughs> age appropriate that wasn't 11 was me that's amazing so i got the call yeah and it was a shocking call because i you know i couldn't believe it because uh you know i wasn't 11 but either was jake yeah so uh yeah when they aged up the character of donnie darko that opened up the door for me to get the role and uh i definitely had the time of my life making that movie i'll tell you that uh it was an incredible experience uh obviously you have prolific careers like jake gyllenhaal and seth rogan started right there on that movie yeah um you know and patrick swayze obviously a legend and uh drew barrymore was my teacher um but uh, and richard kelly the director who came out of usc film school that was his first movie talk about a great first movie um yeah. but yeah the thing about donnie darko was it was very very strange a very weird script it was a very weird movie and i don't even know that the people that were making the movie at the time fully understood what was going on we just would show up and do these scenes and try to have as much fun as we could yeah. and try to make each other laugh and try to make the people behind the monitor laugh. Like it was like a summer camp. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, to see the movie at Sundance, I remember like when the final credits were rolling, people were like, <laughs> like they didn't, <laughs> it was no, like really, what is, really yeah. uh, but it was definitely like very cool, very different, uh, but a, a big head scratcher. Yeah. Uh, then the movie came out in the theater about, I'd say, a few weeks after 9-11 happened. And since the movie had a plane engine falling on a house, it didn't really do well. 
It actually right. bombed in the theater. It made like 150 grand or something. It was like a disaster in the movie theater. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was over. And then uh, it came out on DVD. You remember DVDs? I remember those, yeah. Uh, it came out on DVD and uh, it took off. Like college kids really got behind it and it sold millions of copies of the DVD and it was so successful, so much so, that it came back out in theaters mm. two years later and it had a whole renaissance and then from there it just became this thing. It's and it's funny because back then DVDs saved a lot of shows, not just Donnie Darko. Like think of a show like Family Guy. Yeah. Uh, Family Guy was off the air and the DVDs sold so well that they were like, what the fuck, why do we cancel this? They got to bring it back. Yeah. Uh, you know, so Donnie Darko is a ex perfect example of that. And it's, it's also a very good lesson in filmmaking, you know, to like not give up. <laughs> like, you know, you can make a movie and two years later, someone could discover it. Yeah. And it could turn into something. Or 10 years later, you don't even know. Yeah. Like, uh, but that's, that's the case for Donnie Darko. And it's definitely, probably, without, doubt, without a doubt, the biggest movie I've ever uh, been a part of. All-star cast. And the experience of making it, you know, are some of the best memories you could possibly have. I'm glad you brought up this Sundance premiere because I remember reading that something really unexpected happened in the middle of the uh, middle of the screening. Could you talk about that a little sure, bit? Sure, sure. It's a it's a pretty funny story, and the people that were there can attest to it. I had mm -hmm. some of my friends that were there at the screening, mm -hmm. but the first public screening, not the Sundance like judges screening or whatever like yeah. the first public screening where the public could come and watch the movie Halfway through the movie the projector broke and the movie started playing backwards oh, no. And at first people it's a weird movie So people thought it was part of the movie and yeah. like the characters I remember specifically it was a scene where Jake Gyllenhaal and Jenna Malone's character are talking in the woods And then it cuts to this guy in like a red tracksuit that's mm -hmm. like been standing there watching them very yeah. funny moment in the movie but then it started playing backwards and people thought like this is some kind of like David Lynch weird shit that's going on and it was it kind of fit the tone of the movie but then the reel just sort of like ended and yeah. the movie just stopped and everybody was like ah uh. and I remember the director Richard Kelly went up and Sean McKittrick the producer they went up they started trying to do a Q&A mm -hmm. and the movie was only halfway through and people didn't really know what the <laughs> hell, going on. Yeah. they didn't really know what they were watching yet so they didn't know what to ask yeah. and so it was really just was like this awkward thing and the projectionist that was supposed to fix the movie was nowhere near the theater. They were like 30 minutes away. Yeah. So there was like a big 90 minute kind of stall. And it was just so uncomfortable. One of my buddies uh, who was there with me, I, uh, my buddy Kenny and my buddy Josh, they were like, go, just go up there, go up there. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm not going up there. And they're like, just go, just go. Mm -hmm. And I know like Jake had gone up and other guys had gone up to try to think, but it was just, so I just like went up there and <laughs> I ended up taking the mic and just like sort of entertaining the crowd for like an hour <laughs> while, yeah. while they were fixing and nobody left. It's so good. And yeah. I started doing, uh, you know, I was doing like some stand up comedy and crowd work and then I started rapping and I, there was a guy that could right. beatbox. Yeah. Like, a, and he started beatboxing, so I just started freestyling and then everybody loved it. And it ended up being like this big hit. And if you watch the, uh, director's commentary of Donnie Darko. I, I know Jake and uh, Richard Kelly, they're in the commentary, they allude to this night. Right. Um, but uh, it was like a magical night. It was, it was like, you can't imagine how amazing that was. So this, After, is, this is how your singing career began, Yes. I guess. This is your first public singing there performance? There was some, someone in the crowd that saw that and was like, hey, why, you want to come to the studio and back in LA? Yeah, yeah. And it was like, what? Okay, sure. You, you create the stone movement. Yeah, After so that, that. It, it definitely translated into like a music career that I, you know, I had been having fun musically prior, prior to that with friends at parties and my buddy Phil and I had a little thing going where we were doing some rapping, but like nothing that ever had taken off to an extent, but this yeah. sort of pushed me in a different direction. And I'd already, I'd, I'd always been a fan of music and interested in music. And this was a, another opportunity that just opened up. You never know what can happen, right? And that's, what, that's, an, that's one of those like, you never know what can happen moments. But it was, uh, it was incredible. And I, you know, anybody who's associated with the movie that was there that night, like they'll tell you the same thing. It was like, yeah. it just it didn't seem real, <laughs> you know? It was awesome though. Yeah, the stone movement came yeah. out of that. And yeah. then out of that, during one of your performances, you met a very important person or there was a very important fan that you had and his yeah. name was Jamie Kennedy. Sure, yeah. Could you talk about how you two met? 
So Jamie Kennedy and I did a cartoon show in like the late 90s called The Mob, which was like a series about these rappers mm -hmm. that, so we were doing this like rap cartoon together. Yeah. So we were, this is this before he was doing Malibu's Most Wanted or anything like that. We were doing this, this sort of rap cartoon together and we became really good friends. And he, he was a big fan of the music that I was doing and he would always you know, listen to it in his car and he was always very supportive of it. And uh, I, when I had my first concert, he was there, he came up on stage, it was like a whole thing. Um, and about a year later, he called me uh, after Malibu's Most Wanted came out mm -hmm. and he you know, played uh, B-Rad. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie. It's an amazing movie if you haven't seen it. It's re very, very smart, uh, but it's called Malibu's Most Wanted. And he wanted to do an album, a B-Rad album in character. So he asked me if I wanted to help him make some songs and write some raps and produce some music. And I was like, sure. So we rented a studio and we started recording demos. And so I would lay down the track and then Jamie would come in and hear the, the song, hear you know the guide track and he would come in and he would rap. And I, on the first demo, like some of my vocals still stayed on. Then the second one, there was a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then he was finally like, well, why don't we just do this together? And I was like, sure. And so we started recording music that we were gonna put out in like a, as a comedy album. But the problem was that our songs were funny, but they were pretty good. Like we were playing them for people and it didn't sound like Weird Al or, you know, later on the Lonely Island was doing like silly rap songs, but it didn't sound like that. It sounded like guys, like more like Beastie Boys or something that was more kind of fun, but pretty good. And so we were like, well, why don't we try to get a record deal? And so we kept trying to get a record deal and um, we couldn't get one. And everybody was like, well, in order to get a record deal, you have to get a famous person to co-sign for you. You need a big rapper to be on your song in order for people to take your song seriously. So we reached out to all the rappers and nobody wanted to do a song with us. Like no. we met with Jay-Z, yeah. we met with uh, all sorts of people. Yeah. Uh, we reached out to Nas, we reached out to everybody that we could think of that was big at the time. Yeah. And like there was nobody that was interested. And so finally, one day Jamie and I are sitting around and he, he's, I'm like, well, we gotta get somebody. Uh, so he gave me his phone and at first, the idea was to call Jeff Goldblum. Uh, he had been on Jamie's uh, hidden camera show, The Jamie Kennedy Experiment, and Jeff was a real funny guy. And so we thought, let's do a song like Rolling with Goldblum. <laughs> yeah. So Jamie called Goldblum, and Goldblum was like, nah, well, I'm kind of shooting something else. Maybe, could be, like, but I, I you know, he didn't say no, mm -hmm. but he wasn't like available like to come in when we needed him. Mm -hmm. So Jamie throws me his phone, and I'm just like sort of looking through his contacts and I get to go through A, and then I get to B, and I land on Bob Saget. Like, Bob would be amazing. And I love Bob, I was a huge Bob fan. Yeah. And Jamie's like, well, let's, tr let's call him. So we call Bob, Jamie calls Bob, and uh, we end up going to meet Bob for like a matzo ball soup somewhere, and pitch him the idea and Bob's like yeah like I'm in so I called my buddy Derek who is a rapper a Toronto rapper and producer by the name of Decisive who I'd made some songs with pre previously but he's a really funny and talented guy and I pitched him the idea of doing this Bob Saget rap song and I need to get a beat and you know maybe can you throw something together and uh, Derek sent me this demo back which was so good uh, which was the demo for Rolling with Saget and so, you know, I basically took what he sent me and I added my own like flavor to it. And I, some of the killer lines are Derek's. Like he, I don't want to say them now, they're pretty dirty, but to have Bob say those lyrics, I know Derek loved that. But, uh, you know, so I came and me and Derek sort of worked together, sort of crafting the perfect sort of song. And then Bob came in the studio and Jamie didn't show up. He was supposed to be there, but he got like held back at something. So I was alone with me and Bob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I had to like show him how to rap, and he was amazing. Bob was fantastic. Yeah. I'm Bob Saget, this is what I do. My house, my car, this is my crew. Oh. I only hang with Jazami and Stu. Patrol the mean streets of Malibu. Night, boys. Tomorrow night we gonna do it again. Bob Saget, my best friend. And sure enough, the advice that we got, you know, get a big rapper to be on your song and you'll get a record deal. 
it turned out that we that was sort of right, but we got Bob Saget, and that ended up getting us a record deal. It took a long time to get that record deal, but we ended up getting an MTV show, and we ended up shooting music videos, and Bob was a part of the whole thing. And you know, had we done it with Nas or someone else, like they probably wouldn't have done all that. Yeah. But Bob was so cool. Not that they're not cool, but I'm saying Bob was so open to this that he sort of like lived the part. And we really did roll with Saget. And we would you know, hang with Bob. And there was a stretch where we were inseparable with Bob. Um, and obviously Bob has passed away now. And that's beyond tragic. Uh, he was so young and still so amazing. Beyond his talent, he's also just like the nicest man, you know, a, a big time philanthropist, raising money for lots of charities, showing up whenever you needed him, the type of friend that like, you know, I know Jamie was much closer with him at that point, but you know, me and Bob ended up bonding our, on our own. And anytime I needed something from him over the years after that, he would always, whatever, like my nephew, uh, I wanted to get a video for my nephew for his birthday and like Bob like sent a video, like, oh, okay. or me and Adam, had written this movie about a talking dog and Bob was like yeah I'll do it like we we were he was just so amazing and so supportive of of people that he cared about and I'm so lucky that I'm one of the people that he happened to care about um, but yeah he is yeah. definitely missed and if it wasn't for Bob Saget I might not even be sitting here uh, not necessarily with you but just here to talk about any of this stuff because it was such a career changer for me it's great that he was so generous with his oh. time especially at the level that he and, that, and you know, most people knew Bob queens. at that point. Younger fans knew Bob Saget from Full House, where he played the yeah. dad, who's like obsessed with cleaning, and he's like the very vanilla character. And he was the host of a show called America's Funniest Home Videos, which is a very family-friendly kind of show. But the real Bob was a very, very dirty comic. Yeah. Uh, and so leaning into that Bob mm -hmm. was the thing that was shocking. And, but you know, after he rolled with Saget, uh, did Roland with Saget, then he's on Entourage. You know, he started leaning into this a lot more and uh, absolute legend. And Bob, up until his passing, was doing comedy shows and every time he came on stage, that was the song that brought him on stage, that was the song that brought him off stage. Uh, we did the HBO Comedy Festival with him where we got to perform it live in Vegas in front of, a, you know, thousands of people. Bob knew every word. Like, he didn't have to be coached. Yeah. He, like, knew, he knew the song better than I did. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Bob's, Bob is a legend, probably the coolest celebrity that you could meet. <laughs> Who You know, they say, don't meet your heroes. Meet Bob Saget, he's, he's a hero worth meeting. Um, he was so generous, like you said, generous with his time, but just, it's hard to explain, man. The guy was so sharp, so funny, and he is so missed. Yeah, well, it was great that you had those experiences with him. And yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And you went on to do Blowing Up with Jamie Kennedy yeah, as yeah. a TV show. Sure. And also beyond that, you guys went to many adventures together as well. I One of the craziest ones must have been when you went to Operation Iraqi Freedom. Yes. And you went to entertain those troops. What was that experience like? I mean, the tensions must have been so high. A crazy experience. Um, my buddy Cable Guy Jeff, uh, has, he has released several documentaries about this period online. So if you want to check out uh, Jeff's movies, one of them chronicles Blown Up, but one of them really chronicles this entire trip to Iraq. He's got all the footage. Um, but how that came about was uh, Jamie and myself did a commercial for a, a mattress company in Houston called uh, Gallery Furniture, like a mattress furniture store. And the guy's name is Mattress Mac. Hi, folks, this is Mattress Mac, and I'd like to talk to you about one quarter of your life, six hours a night you spend in bed. If your mattress is older than 10 years old, older than 10 years old, pick it up and throw it out. Come to Gallery Furniture, get yourself a beautiful new Sealy Posturepedic mattress. Get the best sleep money can buy on a Sealy Posturepedic mattress. They're all on sale right now. Gallery saves you money. You may have heard of him because he's gone viral in the last five years as like this guy that bets like millions of dollars on sports games and he's become this huge sort of viral sensation with his sports gambling. But this guy's a furniture guy. And me and Jamie went and did a commercial with him. And uh, I was dressed up as a mattress. And, and we were rapping like, we, the song was called Mattress Mac. He's, okay. That was his name, Mattress Mac. And so we did a rap song. We ended up recording the song with Paul Wall. Mm -hmm. So myself, Paul Wall, and Jamie Kennedy have this song called Mattress Mac. You should look it up. It's really funny. Uh, and Mattress Mac was like, yeah, you guys can do all of this stuff, but you know, I'm gonna, you're gonna have to do something for me. I'm gonna call in a favor. 
and you're going to have to do something for me. And we were like, yeah, sure. Okay. Thinking like, you know, what's that favor going to be? It wasn't nothing. Mattress Mac called and set up this USO tour for myself, Jamie, and Paul Wall to go to Iraq, Qatar, Fallujah, Baghdad, to in the middle of like a heated conflict over there to entertain the troops. Uh, and at first I was scared to go because I'm like, what the hell am I going to do over there? Um, but it was, it was the experience of a lifetime. You can't imagine, uh, you know, going over there, experiencing it, seeing it firsthand with your own eyes, meeting the troops, uh, you know, living amongst them, flying with them, flying in and out of sort of like active war zones, wearing bulletproof vests and helmets the whole way through, performing in comedy for an audience that's everyone's holding a machine gun. <laughs> yeah, and the week before you went, I read that a chopper got shot down. Yeah. So especially at that time, it was, it was so very, much very, fun. Yeah, it was a very, very heavy conflict. I thought it would get canceled because of that chopper that you're talking about. It didn't yeah. get canceled. No. Um, but it was, it was the experience of a lifetime, and I highly suggest you seek out uh, Cable Guy Jeff's uh, documentary that he did on it online. It's really, really cool, and it has all of the footage of us. We stayed at Saddam Hussein's palace. We, you know, it was... The stuff that we saw and experienced, <laughs> you couldn't imagine it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you couldn't even imagine it. What an adventure. And the next one that really sticks in my mind is you did the Return of the Stone Movement. I feel like that's different from everything else we had done previously because it was a lot more personal. Yeah. The music was a lot more personal. And what was that process like doing that kind of soul searching that wasn't ordinarily seen in the other stuff. Yeah, it was uh, definitely, I was all in on music at that point. I fell in love with it, obviously. The experience of having a record deal and having, you know, had a recording studio with my some of my best friends in the whole world. We all teamed up and had a recording studio. And it, I was like living, breathing, eating, sleeping music. So the opportunity to record, you know, another album, I jumped at that opportunity um, and, you know, wrote a bunch of songs and, worked with my friends and, you know, sort of made it happen. The album didn't exactly go crazy, but it was definitely something that I'm proud of. I get a little embarrassed nowadays, all these years later, I like reflect back and I'm like, I kind of roll my eyes that I even did all that stuff. But like back then, the mindset was, I was very, I was all in on it. I was very serious about it. And I was like trying to make songs. I wasn't trying to make raps. I was trying to make songs and tell stories. And, uh, you know, some of them are better than others, but you know, like I said, now it's like embarrassing for me to even talk about. And I don't know why that is, but I just feel like, you know, as you get older, you sort of look back at stuff you did younger and some of the stuff you're like, ugh. Okay, I'm sorry for bringing it up. No, 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 I don't, I'm not embarrassed about okay. it, that stuff, but yeah. it's just, you know, it's cool that I did it. It's, you know, it's, some, it's just like another thing. But there was so much, like there was so much you did during that time frame you went and made the radio show and the, the late night with Stu. Yeah. It was one of the longest running shows on the web. Yeah. With, you were like a podcast pioneer kind of. Maybe without you, maybe we wouldn't have this kind of you know, podcast thing. It's, it's nice of you to say that. And I, it is true The you know, we, my, myself and cable guy, Jeff, we were doing podcasting before the word podcasting even existed. This is in 2005, 2006, we were doing podcasting. We were doing live streaming in 2006 and seven and eight, like just trying to figure out even how to do it. Like there wasn't like a plug and play sort of platform like now. You had to like put, attach this to this and you, it was like a whole MacGyver kind of situation just to make it work. But yeah, we were doing podcasting and we had really great guests and we had like a lot of listeners and you know, people didn't understand what podcasting even was. We were trying to like get advertisers and people would be like, what is, I don't even know what that is. Um, but yeah, we did it for a long time, a long, long time. Uh, TSM Radio was the name of the podcast. Sunday Night Stew was the live broadcast. So twice a week, every week for years, mm -hmm. we were pumping out two shows every week. One of them was live. It is Sunday nights. I am Stu. Yes, you are. And this is the Sunday Night Stu. Yeah. 
and uh, it was it was it was a magical time. But uh, as the as the genre grew and more people entered into the space, it became a lot harder to sustain because it went from like me doing a podcast with my buddies to like famous people doing podcasts with their buddies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, like everybody started doing, a everybody now has a podcast. Like this is my podcast. This is your podcast. Is Back then nobody had a podcast. So yeah. it was like, you know, Tom Green had a show that he did. Yes. Mark Marin had a show that he did. Yeah. But I don't think there's many more, you know? Right. So it wasn't, you know, it was like you could listen to one of us and Tom yeah. Green, he was doing it. You know, I went on his podcast and he set up like a, a talk show in his house and he had like a professional set like he did like a real it was so inspiring and I think he's still ahead of the curve like Tom has been you know he's a guy that deserves some flowers also in this space and obviously Mark Marin but uh, we were we were doing the live streaming stuff and credit goes to cable guy Jeff for figuring out how to do that because like I don't I still don't understand how we made it work but we made it work and uh, it was really, really great until it just became really time consuming when I started getting other jobs and other things happening. It was hard to commit to doing this free content every week and putting so much work into it yeah. when there was like paid opportunities coming my way. Uh, uh, Chris Angel, you got to work with yeah. Chris Angel? That was well, one that's funny, you should mention that's a perfect segue. You never know who's gonna be watching something. That's a lesson for everybody out there. You don't know who's gonna be watching something. Chris Angel watched the Sunday Night Stew. Mm -hmm. He was a fan of the Sunday Night Stew, and he wanted to do a podcast. And so he he reached out. I got a call from a guy who was like, "Oh, I work for Chris Angel. He wants to, you to come out to Las Vegas and talk about podcasts." I was like, "Okay, sure." Like I didn't even believe it. You thought it was a prank call yeah. or something. Yeah. And so I was like, "Yeah, okay, sure. Can we get your information?" Yeah. Uh, okay. The next day, a plane ticket was in my inbox. I fly down to Vegas, I meet Chris, and he's telling me that he wants to start doing live streaming in a podcast and he wants me to come and help him and advise him and he told me that if I help him launch a podcast and live streaming and stuff like that, when he does his TV show, he'll hire me to produce his TV show. And I was like, okay. I didn't think that he'll, you know, most people bullshit you and they tell you stuff just to get you to do stuff and they don't really have any intention of actually following through. But to Chris's credit, he's a man of his word. And myself and Cable Guy Jeff, we came out to Vegas. We were, he, he had a very aggressive approach to doing podcasting and live streaming. He had a multi-million dollar setup. He was like, what Tom Green was doing, times 10. Mm -hmm. Chris really put all of these resources into it. And again, he was very early. Had Chris done that five, six years, seven years later, it would have been a different story. But he was still very, it was still very new in this, you know, in this space, we'll say. But sure enough, Chris got his TV show and he hired me to produce his TV show. And just like that, I was like thrown into the world of magic, um, producing uh, Chris Angel's television show. And it was, you want to talk about a crazy experience like that is, a, you know, you go to film school now. Imagine, I'm telling you that film school is cool, but working for Chris Angel, is like Harvard Film School. Because mm -hmm. not only do you learn how to make a TV show, but there's all these other moving parts to magic. Yeah. You know, you have to shoot at this, you know, there's a lot of specifics. And like I've yeah. signed way too many NDAs to tell you. <laughs> but it was very, very, it was like once we went through that, like I felt like I could do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it is so complex doing a magic show at that level. This is not him pulling a rabbit out of a hat. It all seems so, like, it, it, it seems looks, effortless. It seems effortless, but the truth is, it is the most, you know, and, and the thing about Chris Angel that's so amazing is that if he can imagine it, he's going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Like, you'd be in a meeting with him and the Magic team and all the production staff, and he'd be like, I want to fly from here to there. And be like, how are you going to do that? He's like, figure it out. <laughs> and they yeah. would figure it out. And then he would do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he got buried alive. He got... Uh, uh, caught a bullet in his hand like he did all these crazy stunts that you would think like are impossible and this guy made it happen uh, he, one of the hardest working guys you, I've ever met in my life is Chris Angel and uh, you can say what you want about the guy but like to me he was very very good to me he I definitely got a full education working for him and 
you know, I feel, you know, we spoke recently in the last couple months, we, we, we got to talking again and it sounds like he wants to do some more stuff. So maybe I'll be doing some stuff with Chris again soon. You never know. But uh, what an experience that was. That would be amazing yeah. to see that. And happen. ironically, 5-7 Films, the company that you, uh, you, you're familiar with, I think so. uh, Andrew and Jamie also worked on Chris Angel. That's how I met them. They worked on the production team of the Chris Angel show with me. Oh, that's crazy. And so yeah. now they work. Yeah. Now we all work together all these years later at 5-7 yeah. Films. Right. And that all started uh, with Chris Angel. Those guys went through, you know, we were all, we all, we were in the trenches together. You were all working together and yep. then you, you co-founded 5-7 Films with Adam Rodness. Yes, my brother-in-law, Adam brother -in -law, Rodness, yeah. who is one of the, uh, a guy who doesn't take no for an answer, a guy who makes stuff happen. And, you know, at the point where we started that company, his hustle and his drive were infectious. And uh, obviously he was married to my sister, so it made it an easy choice as far as getting into business with someone you trust that you don't feel is gonna like F you over as a lot of people in this business do. So like teaming up with my brother-in-law was easy because it was like, I trust him, he trusts me, you know? I don't have to worry about that part of it, the getting yeah. screwed over part of the business that happens so often. We started this company together and uh, it was started on a, it's a really funny story behind it that we'll have to tell another time because we don't have that much time here. But in 2015, I had directed no movies. Mm -hmm. Here we are sitting in 2024, I've done six movies. That's some people, incredibly productive. Some yeah. people do zero movies. Yeah. We're, you know, we're gonna shoot our seventh movie this summer. Uh, so it is pretty amazing the rise of productivity that can, you know, the output of productivity that you can have if you really like dig in. And you know, he's the one that really digs in. I mean, I'll, I go along for the ride on the dig in part. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's what he would tell you anyway. But uh, our partnership works very well in the sense that Adam is very much, uh, you know, a great partner for me. Not only in the fact that I trust him and he's married to my sister and you know all that stuff, but creatively we have the, a very similar sense of humor. We make each other laugh. Uh, you know, we have this dynamic that you know we're in these movies together and we're arguing. You know, part of the creative process is arguing. You know, when I was a kid, this is gonna. You guys aren't gonna know what any of this means, but there was a show called Wayne and Schuster. It was a legendary Canadian, like the Smothers Brothers or Saturday Night Live or, you know, a sketch comedy show that was on CBC for many years. It was a very big show. And I was on that show. I was like a kid actor on one of the main, you know, anytime there was a kid on that show, I was on it. And these two guys, Wayne and Schuster, who are comedy legends, comedy duo, would be arguing all day. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it. And like they'd be swearing. I was like six, seven years old. My mom would have to like cover my ears. Like they would be like, what the fuck? Like they would be yelling and screaming. But as soon as they got on set and the camera started rolling, it was magical. Yeah. Now I, all these years later, I look back and see like I'm working with Adam and we have, you know, we go at it, we go at it creatively. And that's part of the magic. Um, you know, if you're a creative person and you're passionate about your creativity, you're gonna fight for your ideas. Now you might not always be right, like you have to be able to say, okay, you, you're right on this one. And you have to like pick your battles, Yeah. <laughs> you know? But Adam and I, we go at it, but, but it's actually worked in our benefit because in our movies, I don't know if you saw Faking a Murderer, I don't know you have, but yep. maybe they have. Okay, and if you haven't, you should watch screeners. it. Yeah, please. Uh, but it's a movie where you actually see Adam and I as ourselves trying to find this killer and we're arguing and all this shit in the movie. And you're playing and yourselves. We're playing ourselves. And, and that's part of the magic of the movie is like seeing these real, like taking our real life relationship and turning the volume up to 11. And you're doing it in front of real people as well. Yeah. So it's like you're throwing yourselves into these real circumstances without a traditional script. Yeah. You're kind of depending on your, your wit, basically. So it's like, how does it feel to do those kind of scenes oh, where you don't know what you're going to say? I have to give some credit to Jamie Kennedy because when we were shooting the Blowing Up show, we were one of the very first sort of hybrid shows where we, Jamie and I knew what was going on and no one else did. And he had a hidden camera show before that. So like his, he was already really into this type of, you know, entertainment. Yeah. But in Blowing Up, it, things changed because it wasn't hitting camera. The camera's there. Mm -hmm. It's out in front and I, I, I loved that. And obviously, oh, and Adam worked on Blowing Up too, so he knew 
you know, that uh, style. So to make a long story short, we did this movie called Jack of All Trades, which is a real documentary about the rise and fall of the baseball, baseball card industry. A really great movie, got on Netflix, put us on the map, really, really great. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, Jack of All Trades experience, we had done some horror movies before that, and we were getting calls, okay, well, we need another horror movie from you guys. And since we had just spent years doing this documentary, Jack of All Trades, we had you know, been shooting in a certain way and editing a certain way. And in, when you're making a documentary, it's way different than a scripted movie. You have this big pile of puzzle pieces and you don't know what the puzzles looks like. There's no box with a picture to mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, this piece goes here, there. You don't have a clue. So you're just trying to fit pieces and it's just like a crazy, crazy experience. Yeah. But we were so uh, sharp at that point that it was like, well, why don't we shoot a horror movie that's shot like a documentary and, and use real people? and go back to that hybrid style. And, uh, and that's what we did. So it's like Adam and I will go with real people. And you know, if I need you to say for our plot, if I need you to say, oh, there's, it's on fire. If I have to sit with you for two hours to get you to say- That's crazy because <laughs> that it's, it's, line, these scenes are like one minute, two minutes long and you spend all that time trying to get them. I want it to be real and authentic and so does Adam. So it would be really easy for me to come in and be like, hey, well, Parsa, do me a favor. Can you just say it's on fire? It's and on then fire. you're going to say it's on fire and it's not people. It's like bullshit. People will see right through that. So if I organically get you to say it and real you says that, then it helps people watching it feel like you're watching something real because you really did say that. So that's sort of a weird way of explaining the style and the technique. But you know, we have a plot that we know we want it. This we know what the beginning is. We know what we want the middle to be. We know what we want the end to be. But we have no idea what's going to happen in between those points. Yeah. So you know, we so go. So it's in, exciting. It's and exciting. Awesome. It's yeah. it's such a cool guerrilla style of filmmaking where it, you never know what's going to happen, and and we just shot a sequel to it, which is going to come out later this year. You were there. I was. Yeah. So you saw how it was. Yep. And you know, we're going out with real people and. And, and you saw it firsthand. Sometimes it took us like 20 minutes to get what we wanted. Sometimes it took us four or five hours to get what we wanted because you don't know what you're gonna yeah. get. Mm -hmm. And also, when you do a hybrid style like that, it leaves it open for excitement in the way you tell your story because something crazy might happen when I talk to you that you might lead us in a whole different direction. And we have the ability and the flexibility to go that direction and see what happens. Now, in our new movie, we're going to search for ghosts. I'm not going to tell you what happens or whether we found ghosts, but in a hypothetical scenario, if we have found a ghost, that changes the plot of the movie. Yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, oh shit, now we have this whole yeah. other thing. And so we have the flexibility to do that. Whereas a yeah. traditional scripted movie, that's your script. You know, you go in and you shoot the scene and everyone knows their lines and they hit their marks and they're lit nicely. And that's not this style. Yeah. So it's really fun. And, to do that, it keeps things fresh, it keeps things exciting, and for 5-7 films, like we have filmmaking ADD. We wanna make every kind of movie. So we, you know, some of our movies are traditional scripted movies like Vandits and Scarecrows and stuff like that. And then some of our movies are hybrids, like Don't F with Ghosts, which is coming out, and, and uh, Faking a Murder. And some are traditional documentaries that are 100% real, raw, and emotive, like Jack of All Trades. Yeah. So to be able to, and, I, and we did a kid's show for CBC. I'd love to do more kids stuff. And 40 Moves, the Rubik's Cube movie. Yeah, that was Adam's first movie that he ever uh, did. Um, and that was a great movie as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my last question, I want to talk about Vandits. Yes. Of course, you know, uh, such a colorful cast of characters yes. in that movie. Each one of them, I was talking to Adam, I'm like, each one of them could have a TV show. Yeah, and they, I, I wish they could, we've been trying. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> But what was it like, because I know you write as well, what was your process like writing those characters? Well, Adam and I have a process where we sort of, and I don't know what they teach you in film school, because like we never went. So, which is crazy, right? Yeah. Um, my film school was being in movies and being on set growing that's, up. That's better off. Is it better, off? better off? It's cheaper. Yeah. You actually get paid to yeah. do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, so we would map out our story. We'd, you know, write the whole story. Yeah. And then we take that story and start creating scenes out of the story. And that's probably how you, you're supposed to write a script, but like, mm -hmm. that's how we do it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we map out our story. We start writing the scenes. We have like a, 
you know, I'll write some, he'll write some, we'll edit each other's work, we'll sit together, we won't sit together, uh, but eventually, you know, we have, as we have, we know how much we have money-wise to make these movies. So when you're writing these movies, you have to write knowing that you can actually make what you're writing. If you write something, you have to make sure that you can actually produce what you are writing. I can't write this action sequence where we drive a car off a cliff because we don't have the money to do that. Mm -hmm. So I can't write us going to 10 different locations and have 20 actors because we don't have the money to do that. I mean, someday we will, but as of now, we're independent filmmakers with big dreams. <laughs> you have to yeah. write what you can actually produce. So there is a bit of a design, a calculated design to writing a movie like Vandits. Yeah. The majority of the movie takes place in one location. The main characters, there's four. Mm -hmm. There's maybe three or four ancillary characters that all live in the same location. So right away, you're, budget wise, you're, you're doing pretty good there. Yeah. Um, and also, we don't believe really in doing like CGI and effects like that. You know, we, if you, we can do it, we will, but practical is what I grew up watching. And real is better. Like real is better. Real faking is better. a murder. Yeah. Real is better. Um, so we, we, we write action sequences or stuff that we know that we can try to do practically. Like, uh, you know, to me, I grew up on the Star Wars movies where it was like people in makeup and like guys with puppets. I believed as a kid that those were real, you know, Chewbacca's a real guy. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, a, 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 that's a real robot. Yeah. But then you watch the other movies and it's like, it feels like you're watching a cartoon because it's like, you know, CGI yeah. and all this other stuff. But obviously they've made it look a lot more real nowadays, but that's, that's, that's the era that I grew up in. And so that's what I romanticize about film is like when people did things practically. And I, I'm sure in your school, they've shown you old like Charlie Chaplin or stuff like that, where like, it's crazy how they did this shit practically back then. Imagine they had no special effects. They'd have to like move a whole set. To, you know? Even still, we're like, how did they do that? Yeah. That's so crazy. And, and like forced perspective and there's all yeah. sorts of ways. And working for Chris Angel, I learned a lot about that type of stuff too. But uh, yeah. I don't know how I got off on this tangent, but we, we write our stuff knowing that we can actually make it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the humor just comes not only from us, but from the performers that end up taking on these roles. Rob Wells from Trailer Park Boys, comedic genius. He's been on television for a hundred years playing yeah. one of the funniest characters there is. Tough, definitely a funny guy. Enrico Colantoni, veteran actor. He's been in a million things, so funny. His humor is almost untapped because he is so much funnier than people realize. Um, you know, Jan Arden, who is a known as a singer, uh, uh, she is very funny on her TV show, Jan. Yeah. But, you know, we had her in this sort of like vulgar yeah, sort of like, role where she killed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the people who played the bandits, Tony Napo, who has been in all of our movies pretty much. He's the, one of the most talented individuals there is. I feel like he can play any role, but he's very funny. Francesco Antonio is plays Vini, one of the funniest guys there is. Uh, Jesse Camacho, who plays Guy, I, I could not watch a scene without ruining the take because yeah. I kept laughing. These guys are so funny. So, so that's what I'm saying. Like these performers take what me and Adam wrote and they take it to a whole other level. And yeah. so, like casting is an important part of your movie too. There's, yeah. there's, you know, you can make a movie that looks really good, but the acting is shitty, and the movie's gonna suck. And you have so much experience acting, you, you must be amazing well, directing the actors, you know? You could say that if you want. I, I'm not going to say that. But I will say, though, that, listen, our movies, the acting is our focus. Because that's what we, we know we can get good yeah. performances and we know we're going to hire really great performers. Like I said, you can see a movie that looks like shit but has really great acting and you might still like it. You can have a movie with really, that, that, that looks like shit with good acting, like I said and it's still, you might enjoy it. But if you have a movie with really bad acting that looks great, mm -hmm. nobody gives a fuck. Yeah, yeah, you know, acting is like the soul of the movie. It is, and so along with that, you have to have good sound, and you have to have good camera, and you have to have good music, and there's all the other things that you have to have. But when it all comes down to it, people are watching a movie, and it's the performers on the screen that have to engage you. If you don't like the performer that's on the screen, or you're not engaged with their character, you're gonna be looking at your phone. Especially nowadays, the audiences have the attention span of they're bored already. I hope you're still watching. Probably not. 
but but my point is is that you know you have to have characters that are people are rooting for your hero not rooting against your hero mm-hmm. or you know they have to be likable in some way there's movies where the bad guy is the good guy you know yeah. I'll, I'll use uh Ocean's Eleven as an example, but in Ocean's Eleven, the bad guys are the good guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's pretty cool that you can do that in a movie. And there's lots of movies that do that. But, you know, if those guys weren't likable or charismatic, the movie would suck. Yeah. And so... All right. How, yeah. how are we doing on time? Uh, we probably are... We're doing bad on time. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this interview, (laughs) Stu. This has been amazing. There's definitely Uh, more to talk about in the future. Absolutely. Uh, But Parsa is uh, an invaluable asset to us at 5.7 Films. He is a hardworking guy. And uh, yeah, if you guys want uh, more information on 5.7 Films, contact Parsa. Thank you very much, Stu, for doing this. It was a real pleasure. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you as well.